Hello, my name is Father John Horan, and I'm a priest of the Diocese of Joliet. I serve in Kankakee at a high school, Bishop McNamara Catholic School, and this is my classroom. So here we are. I'm happy to share a lesson with you on the Eucharist, and especially as a priest, it's a great joy to talk about the Eucharist since it is so central to our faith and this true encounter with the Lord. And so uh, I'd like to start off with a story. When I came to Kankakee, I was ordained about four and a half years ago. And in that first year, I went to a coffee shop and I met three people at the coffee shop. And they were all teachers at a local school. Well, anyway, one was a middle-aged lady, another was a younger lady, and another was a younger man. And they all three had some connection to the Catholic Church. The middle-aged lady said, I was raised Catholic, but not practicing anymore. The younger lady said, I uh, went to the Catholic school, so she actually went here to Bishop McNamara. And the young guy said, I was raised in the faith, and I'm struggling with it. And he said, I don't understand how Jesus can be present in the Eucharist. How is it that we say this is really his body and blood? So it was an interesting conversation. But before I said anything, the young lady who went to this school, Bishop McNamara, where I teach now, said, that's not what Catholics believes. Catholics believe that the Eucharist is a symbol of Jesus' body and blood. Oh! <laughs> so here I was thinking, not just a symbol, and of course now as a teacher, I'm eager to share the other side of that story. So uh, let's go ahead and start with a prayer for our time, I don't know how the other groups go, but I think it's good for us to pray. And this is the Anima Christi prayer on the soul of Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O good Jesus, hear me. Within your wounds, hide me. Permit me not to be separated from you. From the wicked foe, defend me. At the hour of my death, call me. And bid me come to you, that with your saints I may praise you forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'm, I'm going to be sharing with you the Catechism on the Eucharist. And you can find the articles in the Catechism, oops, sorry y'all, on 1322 to 1419. So if you want to follow along, you can open your Catechism to those pages. I went ahead and made it on a slideshow because I thought these words are really rich and we can meditate on some of them. And so I'm quoting them here and I hope you can see them on the screen. But in any case, uh, I'll read it out there for you. So, the Eucharist is totally essential to the Catholic faith. Totally essential and central. And the Church describes the Eucharist as the source and summit of the Christian life. So it is both where it comes from, where our life come, like originates, but it's also the climax, the height. Uh, we are fed by the Eucharist, and we also strive to be united with Christ in the Eucharist and fully united with Him in heaven. That line that the Eucharist is the source and summit actually comes from Lumen Gentium, which is a uh, document from the Second Vatican Council on the Church. The other sacraments and indeed all ecclesiastical ministries and works of the Apostolate are bound up with the Eucharist and are oriented toward it. For in the Blessed Eucharist is contained the whole spiritual good of the Church, namely Christ himself, our Pasch. So just think about that. Everything we do in the Church, everything we do, all ministries, all apostolate, all works, are bound up in the Eucharist and oriented toward it, always directing toward that. And again, it says, because it's Christ, it's not just a symbol. We really believe it's Christ. And so the whole of our, our life is toward the Eucharist. As we say here, Christ is our Pasch, this reminds us of the Passover, and we'll have a chance to look at that as we go as well. 
As the Catechism breaks it down, it also gives a, a bunch of different names for the Eucharist. And so here we go, a list of the names. Of course, there is Eucharist, which in, from Greek references Thanksgiving. I also wonder myself, I put in parentheses for myself, maybe a good gift is another way to say it. And we're looking in Thanksgiving of God's marvelous works, especially the works of creation and redemption that we find in Jesus. The Lord's Supper is another name for the Eucharist, and this recalls, of course, his last supper and the future heavenly banquet. As they say in the Catholic Church, it's not usually either or, it's both and, and so it's both the last supper of Jesus and the supper at the table in heaven, right? So the heavenly banquet. The breaking of the bread is another name for the Eucharist, and this one you'll find in the New Testament the book of Acts, uh, and also in the, in the Gospel of Luke. So the disciples refer to the Eucharist as the breaking of the bread. And what's amazing is Jesus is known in this moment when he reveals himself to the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus. It's in the breaking of the bread. They, see, they recognize who he is. And it says he disappears from their midst. So in other words, all they see maybe was him in the Eucharist. Um, and then, so anyway, then the church remembers this, and we continue to celebrate this, breaking the bread uh, to this day. The Eucharistic Assembly is another name, meaning the people gathered, the visible church that we have. We also refer to the Eucharist as the holy sacrifice, and so then there's the sacrifice of the Mass, sacrifice of praise, and in this, Jesus is offering himself as the perfect satisfaction for sin. He gives himself in this sacrificial way. And when we celebrate Mass, we continue to receive from that one sacrifice of Christ. The Eucharist is also the holy and divine liturgy, the sacred mysteries of prayer in the church. So in the East, like the Greek, uh, maybe the, uh, I blank on the names, but some of the Catholic churches from the East, right, you know, Byzantine, I guess would be the word, Byzantine Catholic would speak of the divine liturgy, I believe, and so there's that kind of phrase, but it's the celebration of this ritual, the holy uh, offering of the Mass there. All right, holy communion is another word, and so this would be a familiar phrase for, for me growing up, like, did you receive your first holy communion, uh, is that phrase. But here, there, in, that, in that name, we have the emphasis of being united to Christ, and so being united in his body. And then also, the last one listed here is Holy Mass, which I think would be what I often call the Mass. You know, we're going to Mass. That's what I always heard growing up. And I might have wondered, where did this word, the Mass, come from? Does it come from the idea of the Masses, like a lot of people are there? No, it comes from mission, or being sent, or the last line in, in the Mass being uh, ite misa est, or it is sent, or it's completed. The Mass, and we have a mission to do as we live our lives. So these are the titles we have for the Eucharist. Oh, I forgot to flip the switch on this one, so sorry everybody at home. Moving on though, we have these, the Holy Sacrifice, Divine Liturgy, Holy Communion, Holy Mass. Now you see it. All right. So now we're looking at this next slide here, Why Bread and Wine? In the, in the Catechism, it starts to consider the the, the church considers, what is the symbolism of bread and wine? Why did Jesus use this? And it says first that it represents the fruits of the earth, and we give thanks for God's goodness in creation. The Eucharist in bread and wine is also a sign from the priest king Melchizedek. In the story of Genesis, he gives bread and wine to Abraham. And this offering uh, in this person returns uh, in Jesus. Melchizedek is this mysterious figure from Genesis, but uh, the letter of the Hebrews refers back to him as the fulfillment that Christ is in the order of Melchizedek. There's unleavened bread in the Passover, in the Exodus story. There's also the wine in the cup of blessing at the, at the Passover celebrations. And these two things become the kind of the central place for Jesus' Eucharistic Passover. There's also the manna in the desert where God provides for his people. Jesus turns water into wine at the wedding feast of Cana, which re resembles his future heavenly banquet and the joy of the new life in Christ. 
Jesus also multiplies the loaves to again show God's providence, uh, God's care for his people. And I think you can also see a symbolism of the bridegroom in the heavenly wine, you know, like what he's offering. And then also a symbol of his kingship. And they say the king is the one who's responsible to feed the people. And they wanted to maybe make him king after he had the multiplication of loaves. But Jesus, in the Gospel of John, after the multiplication of loaves, he turns the corner for them and challenges these disciples. And what does he say? This is truly my body and blood. He says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. He also says, my, uh, yeah, the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. So moving on. Now we look here, Jesus institutes the Eucharist. So again, in John 6, that's the story of after the multiplication of those, John 6, Jesus is describing uh, and really reiterating that his, the bread that he gives is his true body and the blood or will be in the blood that he gives we need to drink. So he initiates this sacrament of the Eucharist at the Last Supper. And what that looks like is he says, do this in memory of me. He gathers with his disciples, the apostles, I should say. And here's what it says in the Catechism, a beautiful line. The Lord, having loved those who were his own, loved them to the end, knowing that the hour had come to leave this world and return to the Father. In the course of a meal, he washed their feet and gave them the commandment of love. In order to leave them a pledge of his love, in order never to depart from his own, and to make them shares in his Passover, he instituted the Eucharist as the memorial of his death and resurrection, and commanded his apostles to celebrate it until his return. I know that's probably breaking the rules to put so much text on a slide, so my bad. But what a beautiful line to consider. Jesus does want not, he doesn't want to leave his apostles, he doesn't want to leave his church, and so he gives himself in the Eucharist so that they can share in his Passover. The Eucharist is this memorial of his passion and death, and he commands them to continue it. He initiates and constitutes them as priests as he washes them and gives them this mandate, do this in memory of me. So it is at the Last Supper that he initiates, he institutes the Eucharist. And what is being offered in the Last Supper? We say it's truly his body and blood. In the Last Supper, he foretells his passion, which takes place the next day. And he says, this is my body given up for you. And on the cross, he really gives his body. And he says, this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant poured out for you. And on the cross, he pours out his blood for the people. And so this Last Supper leads us to a new Passover in fulfillment of the old Passover, where Israel is freed from slavery to Egypt, now Jesus is freeing his people through his own offering. He's the new lamb. He offers himself to free us from sin and death. This anticipates the final Passover of the church in the glory of the kingdom. And so again, this passing over from this life to eternal life with God is anticipated through the Eucharist. So we have a picture of Pope Francis here because the Mass is one for the whole church. It's also one sacrifice. Sometimes Christians will complain or critique the idea of Mass and say, why do we crucify the Lord again and again? But we would say it's only one perfect sacrifice that is offered, and we continue to join in the one sacrifice. The beautiful thing is that the whole church is able to participate in the Eucharist, the Eucharistic sacrifice of Christ. We who are made members of his body are able to therefore share in this offering as we bring our hearts and our whole lives before him at Mass. So this is another big text, I apologize. But once again, this line here is really beautiful. I'm going to just highlight that middle part. In the Eucharist, the sacrifice of Christ becomes also the sacrifice of the members of his body. The lives of the faithful, their praise, sufferings, prayer, and work are united with those of Christ and with his total offering. 
and so acquire a new value. Sometimes when we might go to the Eucharist, go to Mass, we might not feel like we're much engaged. Of course, the goal is to be engaged there and participating in the prayer. And here, there's an opportunity to think about what we bring, our own lives, our own sufferings, our own prayer and work. And we say, I want to unite that to the cross and offering of Christ. And suddenly, the value increases for our offerings, right? Everything is made more resplendent in that sense. The Eucharist is a union of heaven and earth. It brings us into the heavenly liturgy of Christ. So we say it's only one offering, and he's God, and so it's not limited by time. So the members here on earth were brought together, and there is a social element in that regard, but there's also a union with God in Holy Communion, and a union with the whole church in heaven and on earth. So we saw a picture of Pope Francis. He's at the heart, and you know he's part of the Eucharistic celebration. Our bishop is. We name them both. But we're truly uniting ourselves to the whole church who celebrates the same Eucharist. And in heaven, the same offering of Christ that is before the Father. So we get to go before the foot of the cross every time we go to Mass with Mary, united with the offering and intercession of Christ. We're joined to those in the glory of heaven. The angels and saints are with us in the celebration of Mass. So the next slide here, Jesus is truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity. That's a line from the Council of Trent, and I'm happy to rephrase that for us here. We really believe, once again, that this is not just a symbol, right? So some people might say it's a symbol of Jesus, and it truly is a symbol, but also reality. So the sacrament is both sign and reality. And so here in the Council of Trent, and as repeated in the Catechism 1376, we read that, by the consecration of the bread and wine, there takes place a change of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of Christ, our Lord, and of the whole substance of the wine into the substance of his blood. This change the Holy Catholic Church has fittingly and properly called transubstantiation. So this was the question the young man had, what do we mean by transubstantiation? How can this be? Uh, and maybe I'll leave that for the next presentation or for Father Burke to talk more about. But the change of the substance, it's no longer bread, it's no longer wine, now it is the body and the blood of Christ. And we're able to take part in that. The Lord Jesus invites us to communion with him. Uh, in this sense, when he says it's Holy Communion, it's, it's to share in his heart. And an interesting thing I'll just share is in the Eucharistic Miracles, when they study the the actual flesh, when the when the, the what we see as like bread looks like flesh in some miracles, the appearance is there. The scientists say it's actually heart tissue, which is really cool. So to imagine receiving the Lord's heart and being joined there to His heart when going to Holy Communion. Uh, now we should think about how we can prepare for this. And in the, in, the, in the Catechism, it speaks about these um, preparation and sort of expectations around the Eucharist. So we'll take a moment to look at that. We really do need to prepare ourselves for Holy Communion. We can't just walk in and, whew, you know, receive the Lord. So it says first to examine our conscience. And what, what we're looking for is, are there any grave sins in the conscience? And here quoted is St. Paul's line uh, that... If we, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. Whoever eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment upon himself. That would be from 1 Corinthians. So if we're conscious of grave sin, in other words, a mortal sin, we should receive the sacrament of reconciliation before going to communion. The reason for this, again, is we don't want to profane the body of Christ if we're not living in union. We want to actually be in true communion before receiving and saying yes to the Lord. To prepare ourselves worthily also for the sacrament, uh, we should you know, keep the fast. I would say in our Latin church, the fast is one hour before receiving communion, and that fast would be from all food and drink except for water. Uh, 
Some people also have heard like coffee is okay. I'm not going to make any comments on that, but uh, I understand it to be like water and, you know, medicine. If you're needing some medicine, you can take that. The church obliges the faithful to take part in the liturgy of the Eucharist, uh, to attend, right? So taking part is maybe meaning attending uh, on Sundays and feast days or holy days. So we call them obligation. But then we say the requirement to receive Holy Communion is actually once a year. And so you might hear of the Easter duty or Easter obligation, and that would typically be to say, receive Holy Communion in that season of Easter. So it's interesting. The church is saying we should, we really, we really must attend, but we don't necessarily have to receive, although the church encourages us to receive, and that would mean be in a good state of grace to also participate in the sacrament. Uh, some comment, uh, someone might ask, hey, are we missing something because we're only receiving from the bread, you know, the body of Christ right now, what, in the appearance of bread? We're not receiving from the chalice because of COVID and COVID aftermath. Well, I'll just point out this line here that we are truly receiving the fullness of Christ in either species, and they say either the body or the blood. We're receiving all of it in one. Um, however, they do say the sign is fuller uh, if we receive from both like they do in the Eastern Church. But just to say, you do not miss anything if you receive just from one. So here's some spiritual fruits from the sacrament. What material food produces in our bodily life, Holy Communion wonderfully achieves in our spiritual life. Communion with the flesh of the risen Christ, and then I jump ahead, preserves, increases, and renews the life of grace received at baptism. And so imagine the food that we have in the body strengthens us and gives us power to move forward. In the spiritual life, the life of grace received in baptism, we also need that nourishment, and this is the offering the Lord gives to feed us and lead us in our life. And uh, finally, the Eucharist is a pledge of future glory that we will share with Christ in the glory of heaven. Already joined to the body of Christ on earth, we are praying to also be full, full fledged members of the body of Christ in heaven, together with all the saints worshiping God. And so every time this mystery is celebrated, the work of our redemption is carried on. We're being brought toward that goal of redemption and being brought to union with Christ, living with Him forever. Just remember again in, in John 6 unless you eat this bread and drink this cup, you will not have life within you. But whoever eats this bread has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. Um, and I so, so just in closing thought here, I have a picture of uh, a heavenly scene. And this is, I believe, Raphael's image. I forget the name. But we see the church gathered together around the Eucharist. We also see heaven and earth meeting there in the graces of God through the Holy Spirit being poured out. We pray that every time we gather for the Eucharist, anytime we go to adore the Lord there, we can be brought together closer to Christ who loves us and brings us to his Father. And so, may God bless you all and thank you for joining in this session. Hope it was a good one. Bye.